okay so uh, this is lecture 2 okay and uh, the last class what we were seeing was uh, a very high level picture of what a digital communication system is supposed to do uh, close some some kind of a definition of the major parameters and all that okay so i'm going to remind you of that so the problem we have at hand is basically uh, I'll, I'll do a block diagram kind of description and you'll see this block diagram description is very very useful and helpful to imagine and visualize these kind of systems so you have a transmitter and a receiver the transmitter gets say a vector of bits b okay and it's supposed to convert that into a signal x of t which goes through a channel right and that the output of the channel you get y of t which is received by the receiver and the receiver has to produce an estimate of what the bits transmitted could have been okay so this is a nice block diagram of what we saw before and uh, this kind of completely defines the problem of digital communication okay so what do we have to do we have to design okay two functions if you will okay you can think of this tx and rx as two function right so x of t is this transmitter function of this vector b okay and what's uh, b hat b hat is whatever the receiver does to y of t to produce the estimate okay so given given a certain b and given information about a certain channel okay channel is kind of known to you you have to design tx and rx such that you can achieve communication at very low error rate and all that okay so you want b hat to be equal to b right so without any uh, serious problem so that's what that's what i want to that's what i want to capture kind of in this picture hopefully it's clear okay so so a few things we saw uh, the the main parameters here which we'll have to play with and be careful about the first thing is power okay power of x of t okay so there's a there's there are ways to write it down mathematically in terms of what it is right so typically when you have a voltage or current the power is square of that quantity okay you think of x of t as a voltage or current in some circuit the power would be square of that quantity okay so that goes with the relationship b square by r and i square r so power square of that quantity is instantaneous power so x square of t would be instantaneous power okay so typically we'll we'll be worrying about the average power of x of t okay so not the instantaneous power and some systems instantaneous power is also important but usually the average power so when you do average power what should you do you integrate out x square of t and divide by the total time okay so that will give you a way of calculating the power that x of t has okay the transmit signal x of t has okay so this is going to be again once again remember this is average not instantaneous maybe this is some px okay so usually there will be an upper bound on this okay so there will be an upper bound on the transmit power you will be constrained to transmit at powers less than average power less than a certain maximum power possible okay that's the first thing and the next thing is bandwidth or spectrum i'll say bandwidth of x of t this will also be constrained okay so this will also be constrained because of the channel and all all kinds of other things that i talked about there will be a there will be a constraint on this also so these two guys will be constrained okay so this is what i mean by knowing the channel okay, so, right so you know what your constraints are given these two constraints you have to design these functions t of tx and rx so that what is your objective your objective is to get a reasonable bit rate okay so your bit rate should be some some kind of reasonable number or if if you want me to uh, be specific on it maybe maybe you want to have a some kind of a trade off between the bit rate and the next quantity of interest to you which is probability of error or error rate of your system okay so if you think of this vector uh, b as b1 b2 so on okay and b hat as b hat 1 b hat 2 so on okay so this probability of error is probability that bi hat is not equal to bi okay so one assumes this this is kind of an ideally ide identically distributed for each bi okay so all bits are equally uh, are going to have similar behavior and you get a certain probability of error okay so so what would you desire for bit rate you would want as fast a bit rate as possible what would you desire for probability of error as low a probability of error as possible okay so those two things 
are, are going to be related and there's going to be some kind of a trade off between these two there's going to be a trade off between these two there's going to be a trade off between these two trade off here trade off here everywhere okay so all these four quantities are going to be closely interrelated okay there's also another quantity which i have not written down here which is the receiver noise okay so that's also very important noise power which maybe i'll call pn okay so bandwidth of x of t i didn't put a number for it say w okay so so noise power is also important we saw noise power is another quantity which affects probability of error and in fact it's also related to bandwidth and all that so you'll see it's all all these quantities are interrelated okay so so our goal in this course roughly is to study given a set of constraints on these quantities how do you go about designing tx and rx what are the interrelationships okay so one simplification we did to get rid of all the physical properties of the channel is to come up with a mathematical model for the channel itself so one model that i wrote wrote down last class which i said which will will follow pretty much throughout the course the most general model is what it's a linear gaussian model that i had okay so maybe i'll write it right here i'll say y of t is what x of t convolved with impulse response h of t okay so maybe you can't see it plus a noise okay so this is my linear gaussian model and like i said it's a very very powerful model you design uh, you design for it and for such a model and it's directly translatable into several actual physical systems including wireless wireline optical whatever you name it okay so it's all possible so it's a very powerful model and then we made a few simplifying assumptions to get this linear gaussian model into a slightly simpler form to start off with which was the a band limited ideal model okay so what what what's ideal about my uh, channel i'm going to say h of h of f which is the frequency response of h of t it's going to be one bit in the bandwidth of interest minus w to w for instance okay so there it's going to be one so it's an ideal thing but it's band limited okay so so that's the that's with that understanding we could move from here to y of t equals x of t plus n of t okay and this was the ideal band limited additive gaussian noise model for us so n of t is going to be gaussian and all that and that's fine so for instance it's it's quite surprising that with such an abstract model a lot of things are known for instance the most ideal trade off between all these quantities is known okay and this was found long long back in 1949 by claude shannon in one of the first papers to ever show up in this area okay so he he found this very surprising and nice result suppose you want the probability of error to be arbitrarily low when i say arbitrarily low it means as low as i want okay to be arbitrarily low then he showed your rate will have to be less than or equal to w log base 2 1 plus px by pn bits per second well this is bits per second okay so quite a surprising and powerful result to have come up very early on in the theory okay so given that you want your probability of error to be driven arbitrarily low as low as you want which is what you want right then your rate will have to be less than this for this model okay so it's a surprising and nice result and this this such results have actually given given shape to most of communication theory as it happens today okay so that's just wanted to write it down so that you know what uh, the kind of powerful results you can derive with simple models like this okay so that's the uh, that's the that's the formula and you'll notice a couple of things first thing is the rate seems to grow I'm sorry two okay so rate seems to grow linearly with the bandwidth w okay so that seems to be good enough and the other thing it depends on is only the ratio px by pn okay which is the power of x of t average power of x of t divided by the average noise power that's what it depends on it doesn't depend on for instance px separately or pn separately okay so it depends so you'll see pn actually depends on w also okay so that's something i have not shown here pn will depend on w so it's it's kind of a twisted thing but but in terms of the rate it depends only on the ratio okay so that ratio is important we'll define it later on and proceed okay so this is roughly the system that we'll be dealing with pretty much throughout this course our, our goal will be to change these some of these assumptions and design different types of transmitters and then define suitable receivers for them then define suitable quantities to analyze probability of error all these things so we'll keep coming back to this picture over and over again and and these kind of block diagrams are very very powerful uh, 
uh, tools kind of almost like a tool okay so you'll we'll start with a big block diagram and split it up into several smaller blocks and then design each block separately it's, it ends up being a very very powerful tool okay any questions on comments on any of these things it's a very provable accurate theorem okay maybe we'll see a proof of it towards the end if we have time okay so so a couple of other things just to give you a big picture in case you are seriously thinking about becoming a communications engineer or getting into some research in this area so big picture of how the different fields or courses that you have taken so far interact okay so you have i'm going to put digital communications at the center because you're doing the course right now so i'll put this at the center maybe it's not at the center for depending on where you are okay so there are two related areas which feed into it which guide the design of com digital communication systems okay so the one thing is uh, information theory okay information theory which is what enables you to get results like that r less than or equal to w log base 2 1 plus snr for instance so those kind of results come from information theory and in fact this is closely related to coding error control coding and coding theory so information theory and coding theory feed into the very fundamental basic designs of communication systems how you go about doing it what's what's the right metric to look at how do you do it and all that okay so once you know the high level design that high level design has to be translated into a lot of algorithms and those algorithms are typically done in signal processing okay so you have signal processing kind of feeding into this okay in particular today it's just completely digital signal processing there is some analog part towards the very front end but everything else is completely totally digital okay so it's all digital signal processing and of course there are parts which you still cannot build build without any rf and analog things particularly in some uh, in high frequency and all these things so you have the rf analog part feeding into the very front end of these things and then of course for for very fast functioning and compactness and all that you have digital vlsi building it all so all these things play together in so the things on the right hand side are more like tools for translating the design you have into algorithms implementations and all that okay and things on the left are fundamental tools to design the system itself okay so there's also a area called communication theory which kind of puts all these things together okay so you can imagine communication theory at the intersection of all these three okay so how do you build communication systems building these things okay so this, this is so so depending on where you want to be in the scheme of things you might want to specialize in one of these things and maybe know the other things as enough to do okay but of course there are not strict divisions people who do analogs claim to know a lot of digital communication also these days right so they, they do a lot of stuff back and forth so there's all all kinds of give and take okay all right so that's pretty much as far as introduction and other things are concerned so then in the rest of this lecture we're going to spend beginning with preliminaries that you need to be able to understand most of this course okay so that's what i'll do now okay so these are all basics which you should already know and be very very familiar with at this point okay so i'm going to assume that and uh, we'll go through it at a very very fast pace okay as fast as possible i don't want to spend too much time like i said it's only to fix notation okay nothing nothing else most of it i will state and i'll go through very quickly and it's you, you may not even want to write these things down because i'm not trying to really make you understand or anything like that i'm going to quickly state all these things hopefully it's all very very familiar to you in case something is not familiar you've never seen ever before st uh, stop me at that point maybe we'll go into some detail okay so the first thing is uh, we'll be dealing with complex vector spaces okay the notation i'll use for a complex vector space of dimension n is this crazy c c with a stroke right in the middle cn okay and a vector in cn i'll denote as z which will be a column vector but just for compactness i'll write it as z1 z2 zn transpose okay so when i say transpose it is it becomes a column vector this is an arbitrary vector in z okay in in cn okay you can think of your discrete time signals for instance okay so of course you have the infinite uh, uh, Le sequence length but usually when you deal with it in practice it's always finite length or you deal with it in finite length so so all your discrete time signals will be will be will belong to some complex vector space okay so what is each of the zi each of the zi is a complex number hopefully you are very very familiar with it a, co <coughs> a complex number is is uh, a real ordered pair of real numbers the root of minus 1 i'll denote j okay so x of i plus i of i you can also write it as in polar form as 
or theta. Okay, so all these things are very very standard. You know how to go from one to the other. Okay, it's quite uh, good enough. Okay, so a dot product defined in this uh, in this vector space z1 z2 okay is actually summation z1 i z2 star i where star is complex conjugate i equals 1 to n it also has a more compact notation which is z2 hermitian z1 okay what is z2 hermitian you do a transpose and then you take conjugate of each element okay and you have the norm norm of vector z which is what z inner product with itself which will be summation of uh, square okay mod square of each element of c okay so that's the complex vector space hopefully that's very very familiar the second thing that we'll be dealing with so that's for discrete time signals for continuous time signals we need vector space with whose elements are signals okay or functions of one variable usually that variable is time for you you can also keep it as frequency if you like and you can know you know how to go from one to the other as well okay so that that the signals will live and typically most of the signals we see live in this function space which is called L2 okay so this L2 is a special function space it actually collects all finite energy signals together okay finite energy is pretty much all the signals that you have right so finite energy signals are, are belong to X, L2 there's a very uh, simple definition for it x of t okay this L2 is set of all x of t such that integral from minus infinity to infinity absolute value of x of t squared dt is when i say less than infinity i mean it's finite okay so it doesn't go doesn't go to infinity what is so so x of t is complex valued okay it can have a real part as well as an imaginary part okay so when absolute value is the absolute value for the complex number so like i said l2 collects together all finite energy signals for instance finite signals that's that are spread over only a finite time and are bounded will belong to l2 so likewise signals that are spread over a finite frequency and are bounded in frequency will also belong to l2 okay so l2 is a very very nice space it's very well behaved a lot of things happen very very comfortably there you don't have to worry about weird things in l2 okay so the in l2 also you have an inner inner product which is x of t y of t this is integral minus infinity to infinity x of t y star of t dt okay so this is a valid inner product it satisfies all the properties that you need and it also you also get a norm from this okay so the norm is, is what's called the two norm which is which will work out to if you do x of t comma x of t it will work out to mod x of t squared dt so you see so norm is kind of so all finite norm finite two norm signals will belong to l2 okay so that's l2 for you it's got a nice inner product as well all right so 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 often so this is like i said what what is l2 l2 contains are continuous time signals that we'll be dealing with in in this course okay sometimes you you might also it's also useful to have signals which are not really finite energy infinite energy but finite power okay several times you deal with it what's a very good example finite power infinite energy signal that you use all the time sinusoids okay sinusoids you use all the time and it's a good abstraction to have and have good theory for it and that that we'll say belongs to this function space l infinity okay well it contains many more things than sinusoids but i'll just simply define l infinity because that's the only thing that's uh, it's very nicely defined in theory okay so we'll say it's bounded bounded functions okay so the function itself is bounded it doesn't explode like a sinusoid right so sinusoids will behave here and this is not such a nice space for instance there's no inner product here there's no norm this you can define a norm but the inner it doesn't come from an inner product okay so it's not a very nice space and a lot of strange things can happen in this space but we won't worry too much about it but for us the main use here will be uh, it contains sinusoids okay contains for instance sorry contains for instance e to the power j omega t okay which is a which is an in, indispensable function in any uh, signals course so sin omega t cos omega t and all that okay so so these are the two uh, the our signals will live in these two spaces we won't take anything else that's not here okay and then uh, what else what else what else what else okay so so once you have an inner product the inner product obeys uh, okay i'll just keep listing it out as, as soon as i go the inner product obeys what's called the cauchy schwarz inequality okay so it's, it's quite useful several times we'll use it in our proofs okay 
Squashy Schwartz. How does Squashy Schwartz work? If you have two vectors, say S and R, in an inner product space, what do we know is true? What's Squashy Schwartz? The inner product, absolute value of the inner product between S and R. Okay, so the inner product takes two vectors to a complex number. Okay, that's how I'm defining my inner product. Okay, so S and R will be less than or equal to the magnitude will be less than or equal to norm of S times norm of R. When will you have equality here? Okay, equal is too strong. Both have to be differ by a constant, right? Complex constant. So R, if if S can be S is equal to A times R for a complex A, then you have equality in this Cauchy Schwartz. It's if and only if there's no other equality otherwise. Okay, so this is something we'll use quite often sometimes to come up with some results in the proofs. Okay, so the next thing is, uh, I don't know, I'm going to drop the numbering. I've been numbering, but I think I'll lose the numbering pretty soon. The next thing is convolution of functions. Okay, so this is quite important. If you have two functions, s of t, r of t, okay, the convolution is another function of time, which is properly denoted as s star r t, the evaluation at t is going to be equal to minus infinity infinity s of u r of t minus u du. Okay, so this is a very standard definition convolution. So this is the value taken by the convolution at t. Okay, so that's the definition. But usually there's a abuse of notation which help which helps us a lot in terms of uh, ease of working with convolution. You typically write q of t as s of t star r of t but you should know that there is this is a tricky notation sometimes it can lead to all kinds of problems but this is an abuse of notation which we will use in this course okay so the next thing i want to mention is delta functions okay i think enough has been said about delta functions for you as far as uh, we are concerned one of the properties is very useful is the sifting property for delta functions what is this integral defined to be s of not okay so the use of delta function is typically to define fourier transforms for uh, l infinity functions when you have sinusoids you can diffuse this delta function notion and define a fourier transform and so that the whole thing is consistent for l2 functions in l2 fourier transform is properly defined there's no problem once you go out to this l infinity it's not defined properly so you use delta functions to define fourier transform and keep it consistent with all the other definitions in l2 as well so that's useful as far as delta con delta functions are concerned the other thing I'll talk about often is the linear filter. Okay, we'll use these blocks quite often. Linear filter is nothing but an LTI system. Okay, so an LTI system which takes, say, in this case, a continuous input x of t. It's fully characterized by an impulse response. What does it produce at the other side? x of t convolved with h of t. Okay. So that's what happens in a linear filter. We use this quite often. Okay, so any term that I talked about which is strange, it's okay. All right, so maybe the maybe if you've not seen this L2 and L infinity very formally, it's nothing to be really scared about. One thing has an inner product, other doesn't have an inner product. It's the only thing we should know. Okay, beyond that, it's nothing more to worry about too much. Okay, all right. So the ne next one, one small uh, aside here which will be important for us is. Uh, is this computing inner product by filtering, filtering and sampling. Okay, so you maybe you have not seen this very, uh, very formally, it's, it's quite important. Okay, so how did I define inner product for two functions? Okay, so if I have two functions, x of t and s of t, okay, so I'm sorry doing convolution already okay the inner product between x of t and s of t is defined as what right integral minus infinity to infinity x of u s of u du well s star of u du okay so that's how i define my inner product if you stare at it very closely it seems to be quite similar to the convolution integral so it, it makes sense that you should be able to compute the inner product by Convolution. For instance, if you set t equals 0, it seems to be almost close and then you have to only do some adjustment to fit r of minus u to s star of uh, u. Okay, So that's the only adjustment you have to do. And you see here, a linear filter is going to convolve whatever input with its impulse response. So if you select a suitable impulse response based on s of t, you should be able to achieve 
inner product calculation through filtering and sampling sampling at t equals 0 okay so that's the that's the notion of computing inner product and that's called the matched filter k okay, filter matched to s of t so how do you do it you take x of t filter it with okay so something happened here x of t you filter it with s star of minus t okay so that's that's the impulse response which is matched to s of t okay it turns out here if you sample at t equals 0 you end up getting the inner product between x of t and s of t which will be some complex number right some a plus j b okay that's what you get there. okay so it's easy to prove this it's not uh, too difficult but the i'm not going to write write a detailed proof okay try to write down the proof if you're if you're interested it's easy to do it but this impulse response a filter which has impulse response equal to s star of minus t is called a matched filter match to match to what s of t okay so this s star of minus t once in a while i'll use this notation just to ease the confusion because the s star of minus t has so many other things going on around it right there's a conjugation there is a minus t usually when you use it in some others other systems people get confused because of the notation okay so i'll typically use this notation also smf of mm of t i'll say is s star of minus t smf okay subscript is mf which is matched filter Okay, so star of minus t. Okay, so in several receivers, you'll have to do co correlations or inner product computation, and there it's done typically using match filtering. Okay, so this is a very common way of uh, doing this. All right. So a couple of things I want to point out about this because I think if the first time you're seeing it, it's it requires some effort to con translate this into real life. I said all my signals I'm going to imagine are voltage and current in a circuit. What will I do with the complex valued x of t? Can you have complex current, complex voltage? Okay. So it's so what you do is you have to take two signals. That's all. So when I say a complex x of t, what do I mean? I have two real signals, x x r of t, which is the real part, and x i of t, which is the imaginary part, and I'm looking at both of them together as an ordered pair. Okay. So that makes me a complex signal. Okay. So that's the that's the first thing to keep in mind. So this x of t when it's complex is actually two wires okay, carrying two different signals XR of T plus J XI of T. So if I have to implement this, I have to actually do a fairly complicated implementation. I'll show you how it works. Okay, So suppose and similarly this SMF or MF of T will also be what? A real part and a imaginary part. Okay, So I'll call this simply S1 of T plus J S2 of T. Okay, Suppose you have such a picture. This entire filtering is quite complex. Okay, so it's not uh, so it's actually x of t convolved with SMF of MF of t. You'll have to do four different convolutions to execute that. Okay, so you'll have two different symbols signals coming in, wires coming in. One will carry XR of t, another will carry XI of t. Okay, both of them will get filtered by what? Okay, so you'll have uh, okay. I'll, I'll draw four different filters. Okay, so maybe you can do it smartly with just two, but S1 of T, S2 of T. Okay, and then you have S1 of T and S2 of T. Okay, and then how do you finish up the convolution? You will have to do. Okay, so these two, this, this, this has to be added to. Added or subtracted? Subtracted from this guy, right? Am I right? Okay. To get the real part of what's going out. This will be y. Okay, I didn't put y of t here. It's y of t. Y r of t. Okay. How will you get y i of t? You take these two guys and add them. Okay, so it's not really impossible to imagine an actual LTI system or something which which does all this. Okay, so all filters, then addition, subtraction, these things can be done in analog and definitely in digital very very easily without any problem. Okay, so this whole box is basically representative of what that just that one single small box I write with s star of minus t. Okay, so that's that's how we think of complex signals. Okay, two two wires carrying two real signals. 
that's one complex signal okay it's just mathematically easy to write down a simple convolution with complex value signals as opposed to four different convolutions adding and keeping everything real okay so that's uh, that's something and when you sample of course you have to sample both okay so you sample both to get the sample all right any questions on this okay okay <coughs> Okay, so so we're slowly going to move towards spectrum and Fourier transform and all that. So so before we go there, we'll see a few popular signals and uh, give them names. The first one is the sink. What is the sink? The sink in this class is going to be defined like this: sink of t is sine pi t by pi t for t not equal to zero, and for t equal zero, you make it a continuous extension to get one. Okay. So that's my definition for sync, and then I'll also define rect. Okay, rect in from A to B of T will be one for T between A and B and zero outside of it. Okay, and uh, next we'll have unit step. I think this is pretty much all we'll need. If we need more, I'll just introduce it. Wherever. Okay, so I, I think you know what unit step is. Okay, U of t is defined as uh, one for t greater than or equal to zero and zero else. Okay, so that's the that's the definition for uh, functions, standard functions. Sync might be slightly different from maybe what you're used to. Maybe some of you have seen sine t by t. It's not a big difference. Same thing. But uh, some of the transform properties will change. If you're used to the sine t by t, you might want to read up a little bit and make sure you know the sine pi t by pi t change as well. Okay. All right. So, so the next thing we'll define is Fourier transform. Well, this is continuous time Fourier transform. There's also a discrete time version, which we will see a little bit later. Okay. So continuous time Fourier transform. You start with x of t, which is a possibly complex value. Uh, which we'll call time domain signal because I'm going to use t as my free variable there. It's it's uh, it's defined as typically I'll denote by capital letter the Fourier transform of the small letter signal x of f. I'll use f. I won't use omega. Okay, so I'll use f. It might also cause some change in the way you write down the formula. X of t e power minus j 2 pi f t d. Okay, so that's the definition for Fourier transform. And I'm sure you've read enough about it. You know the value of this and it's, it's quite useful okay and uh, it also has an inverse relation which is valid for well behaved good functions it's minus infinity to infinity x of f e power j 2 pi f t d f okay so if you're used to the omega you'll get a 1 by 2 pi in this inverse relation okay so so you do an f you don't get it and if x of t is an l2 Okay, Fourier transform is very well defined. It converges. Everything works beautifully. Capital X of f will also be an L2 function. Okay, in the variable f. Okay, so it will also be L2. It's all very well defined. In fact, it preserves inner products. Inner product between x1 of 2 and x2 of t. x2 of x1 of t, x2 of t will be the same as inner product between x1 of f and x2 of f in the variable f. Okay, so it preserves inner products. So it's a very very nice transformation from one L2 space to another. Okay, but some, very often we'll also use L infinity functions as x of t and expect a Fourier transform and that's defined using delta functions. Okay, so there's all kinds of definitions for that. I'm not going to go into detail there. I'm assuming you're familiar with all that. Okay, so that's the first uh, quick uh, quick uh, property. So so if x of t is an L2, like I said, it's very very well behaved. You can show the inner product between x1 of t. Well, you can first show that x of f is also an L2. So I'm going to write L2 here, but you should know that this L2 is different from this L2, right? What is what is what is different? T has become f. Okay, both of them are complex valued except that T has become f. I think more. You have the same functions here also with f. Okay, it's no 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 big difference. Okay, so the inner product you can show is the same as x1 of f, x2 of f. In particular, if you let x1 equals x2, what happens? You get the familiar Parseval's relation, which says the two norm of x x of t is the same as the two norm of x of f. 
okay so all that is valid in uh, valid for l2 so for l infinity these relationships are more complex we won't worry about it except by saying you'll need delta and it's all consistent all the properties and everything is consistent okay so quick round up of the properties of fourier transform that we will use okay okay so the first one is a uh, very standard fourier transform pair which is used at used for deriving pretty much every other fourier transform pair that you want okay so this okay so this is one more thing so if i write two arrows and put ft means it's a pair okay so t sync ft okay so this is a very common thing and delta of t okay so very often i'll omit the ft so whenever it's clear i guess it's not really necessary okay so ft so clearly one for all f is not a l2 function right so you can't integrate so that's a problem okay so that's the first thing and this pair this pair along with the properties that i'm going to well some of the properties that i'm stating and additional properties that i will not be stating will give you pretty much every other fourier transform pair that you want okay so this is just this is good enough so you should remember this by heart everything else you can derive okay so the second uh, property is uh, if you have x of t being a fourier transform pair with x of f then whole bunch of other pairs can be obtained immediately the first one is remember it's all complex valued okay so i'm all writing complex valued things so this conjugation and all these things have a meaning okay first thing is what's called duality you can show x of minus t will be a fourier transform pair with x of f okay so if you take the capital x function with t as the variable instead of f you get uh, you get the small x of f okay that's duality and then if you conjugate t you get what you get the negative the mirror image conjugate for capital x okay if you do a match function transformation on t on x okay you do x star of minus t which basically you make this the match filter response for x of t then you get x star of f okay remember this this is very important okay the match filter match to x will have a response which is the conjugate of the original response okay so when i say conjugate what happens the real part remains the same the imaginary part becomes minus okay all right so so if we know that x of t is real valued then it turns out there is a nice symmetry okay so what is x star of t if x of t is real value we could x of t so what should happen x of f should be the same as x star of minus f so what this means basically is the positive frequencies are enough to completely describe the spectrum the negative one can be obtained easily from the positive one by conjugation and and uh, time then frequency reversal okay so you do that so this actually translates into two conditions for real and imaginary part of x of f real part of x of f equals real part of x of minus f so this is even symmetry for the real part and you will have odd symmetry for the imaginary part imaginary part of x of f is minus imaginary part of uh, okay fx of f okay so i think this is called conjugate symmetry okay so this is conjugate symmetry and uh, quite a few other properties i'll just quickly list them as we go along x1 of t conjugate co convolved with x2 of t is going to be a fourier transform pair with x1 of f x2 of f use it along with duality you can also get the fourier transform pair for the product it will be x1 of f convolved with x2 of f okay and then uh, the next properties which will be useful are delay and multiplication by exponential these are very useful for us uh, if you delay a time domain signal so to speak by t not you would get a multiplication by 2 pi ft not in the frequency domain okay so what's more important important to us is this guy x of t e power j 2 pi ft not will be what no f not t i'm sorry okay f not t okay will be what x of f minus 
F0. Okay, so this is extremely useful in building systems, particularly communication systems, because like I said, you will uh, the x of t several times the constraint will be is that it should be in a particular frequency band. Okay, and that frequency band may not be amenable to a small circuit board that you might want to build at the transmitter side. So what do you do? You build your signal first in base band in whatever systems you have, and then you use this property to multiply by a suitable sinusoids and shift it to whatever frequency you want just before transmission. Okay, so this is a very useful trick you can use that simplifies your design a lot. Okay, so this is a property that's used used a lot. Another one is scaling property. I just I don't want to write it down. Okay, so I think it's that's enough. That should be more than enough. X of a t becomes one by mod a x of f by a and all that. Okay, all right. So the next thing is uh, autocorrelation and uh, I don't know what number I'm at. Okay, maybe I'll say I'll say three. Okay, so autocorrelation and energy spectrum. Okay, maybe this is not all that familiar. Okay, this is particularly useful when you go to random signals. But for now, we are just dealing with deterministic signals. But even there, let me define it formally so that we'll know what to do when these things show up, even for deterministic signals. Okay, so you have an x of t. Okay, how do you define uh, the autocorrelation? You have an x of t being a time domain deterministic function. The autocorrelation evaluated at tau. Okay, so the autocorrelation you don't use t usually. You say tau, just for uh, uh, just to differentiate it from t. Okay, is this minus infinity to infinity x of u x star of u minus tau du. Okay, right. So once again, this is closely related to inner product and and convolution, obviously, right. So uh, so you see, for instance, at tau equals zero, you pretty much get the norm of x. Okay, and for every other tau, what do you get? You get the inner product of x of t with a delayed version of x of t. Okay, so the so the autocorrelation basically is an evaluation of inner products for all time delays, okay, and it gives you a lot of information about the function. You can show, like I said, it's very closely related to convolution. You can show this is x of tau convolved with x star of minus tau. Okay, so you send x of t through a filter matched to itself, you get the autocorrelation at the outset. Okay, right? Makes uh, makes a lot of sense. So this is XMF. And uh, based on this property, one can quickly show the Fourier transform of Rx of tau will be what? Mod X of F square. Okay, because X of T, X of tau will go to X of F and X star of minus tau will go to X star of F. You multiply the two, you get mod X of F square. So in particular, if you have an autocorrelation function, its spectrum will be what? Yeah, real valued but positive also. Okay, so it's a very good uh, uh, property to have for spectrum. Okay, so that's that's the uh, that's the thing. Okay, so 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 uh, what else? 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 Okay, so the next thing is the energy spectrum. Okay, so it's a very simple definition, but you want to just write it down. Okay, suppose you take x of t and pass it through a very very narrow band filter at f0 okay so i'm going to pass it through a very narrow band filter centered at f0 and and one edge being f0 plus delta f by 2 the other edge being f0 minus delta f by 2 okay so this is my filter maybe this height is 1 okay you would get y of t right so the energy spectrum at f0 is defined as okay once again this is much more useful at for random signals we will come to that at a later time at f0 is the two norm of y of t basically the energy in y of t divided by delta f and you have to tend delta f to 0 okay so delta f is seem to be very very small okay so what will happen if you have a reasonably well behaved x of t this will tend to mod x of f square, f naught square. Okay, so hopefully you can see it all the way at the bottom. So the energy spectrum is very very closely related to the Fourier transform of the autocorrelation function. Okay, so you can see how the how you define 
so similar things for the random signals okay so when you have a random signal x of t each realization is not fixed right it's random so you can't there's no point in computing energy for each realization separately so what do you do you average it out and compute the average autocorrelation okay so in the autocorrelation instead of this you will do an expectation around that and you get a average autocorrelation and then once you get an autocorrelation function it's a deterministic function of time for that you compute the fourier transform you get the spectrum okay so in the random case this makes a lot of sense in extension but in real real in the deterministic case also one can make similar definitions so nothing stopping you okay so so i think i've i've done reasonably okay as far as time is concerned i've pretty much uh, finished up all that i wanted to say the next thing we'll see is uh, baseband and passband signals i basically i think we have about 5 minutes left so maybe i should just quickly define those quantities we'll we'll proceed proceed further later okay so okay so this is again definitions which you might already know but in this context it becomes very very useful okay passband signals okay so when i introduced the ideal band limited awgn channel i said i'm going to assume my h of t is going to have a response which is flat between minus w and w okay so typically that may not be the case okay so based on the requirement you have your h of t might actually be flat in some other frequency band okay so you might be required to operate only in a certain frequency band okay so then you will need a certain passband characteristic for x of t okay x of t should be non zero in spectrum only in some passband okay so for that these passband signals are very very useful okay so let me formally define it x of t is said to be a baseband signal okay if the spectrum of x of f equals in absolute value goes to zero for mod f greater than w for some w okay Okay, so this is a baseband signal. So by definition, all all signals will be baseband, right? So you you also need the other conditions. So x of f should not be zero within the band. Okay, only then it becomes a real proper baseband signal. And you also want to think of w as a very sm reasonably small number. Okay, compared to the actual frequency at which you might be transmitting. So it should be a small number. Okay, so that all that is understood here. So it's band limited to a small band in the baseband. Okay, and the next. Uh, and similar definition you have for an lti system okay an lti filter with impulse response h of t when is it supposed to be baseband i'll say a baseband filter if if h of t itself is baseband okay so that's the definition we have a similar definition for passband okay x of t is passband if mod x of f equals 0 for mod f plus or minus fc greater than w for some fc greater than w greater than 0 okay so around a certain center frequency for a small band you have non zero spectrum everywhere else it is zero that becomes a passband signal okay similarly you have an lti system being passband with impulse response h of t being pass band if what if h of t is pass band okay so throughout this course okay we will consider real baseband signals and real pass band signals okay i've, I've been talking about complex signals also you'll see why soon enough okay turns out real pass band signals can also be thought of as complex baseband signals okay so that's why it's useful to have complex signals in uh, in our mets but still in our entire course we'll be concerned with real baseband and passband signals this is good enough okay so for communication purposes there's really no reason why you should consider anything other than this okay so it turns out this is good enough and uh, these passband signals we will represent as complex baseband okay i'll 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 do this derivation maybe next class okay so you can show a complex baseband signal is representative of a real passband signal so in essence what will we be dealing with baseband signals okay. real and complex baseband signals okay so those are the only things that we'll be dealing with 
uh, this class. Okay, so so there's a not there's a lot of advantage in doing this pass band to base band jump. Okay, so the reason is you will see this, this pass band signal while it seems to be dependent on FC. Once you come to base band, there's no FC in the picture anymore. All you have to do is some multiplication at the end to get any FC you want. Okay, so you can do design independent of the center frequency if you if you concern yourself only with the baseband signal. So that's a, that's an advantage of doing this. Okay, so we'll stop here. If there are any questions? It's a good time to ask. Fine. Okay, so we'll begin next.